seated. How often in different circumstances of life things suddenly jump out at us from a hymn that we had really never noticed before. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice. Rejoice. I suddenly had a very hard time singing that. John was a dear friend. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. We're in Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. The message entitled, Bitter Waters and Sweet Naomi in the Desert, Part 9, because, of course, here we find the bitter waters, the waters of Mara. And you recall when Naomi returned from Moab with Ruth. Everyone came up to her and said, Ah, it's Naomi. She's back home again. She'd been gone more than 10 years. And she said, Call me not Naomi, which means pleasant. She said, Call me Mara, for the Lord hath made my life bitter. She had lost her husband, whom she loved dearly. She had lost both of her sons. She had lost one of her daughters-in-law. But God was about to make her life sweet again and remove the sadness and bitterness. How appropriate that we should be looking at bitter waters and sweet. Naomi in the Desert, Part 9. I just want to summarize very quickly what we have learned so far as we have studied this text. In our current text here in Exodus 15, 22 through 27, we're in the process of studying Israel's rebellions in the wilderness wanderings. You remember God removed them because they rebelled against him ten times. And here is one of those times. Specifically, what we have done as introduction to this material is we've discussed what God does when people rebel against his ordained leadership. After looking at the four areas of rebellion theory, we made application to practical modern life. Then we moved on and looked why rebellion theory is important to know and the biblical response to it. From that, we discovered that rebellion theory covers group rebellion as well as individual rebellion, and we answered two questions. Number one, what if there are multiple leaders in one of the divinely ordained spheres of authority? And number two, what if there is disagreement among the leaders, whom do you follow? We saw the conclusion to that, that multiple leader situations, God always gives one of the leaders the final authority. Then we examined the five wrong reasons that rebels in the Bible used when they tried to co-empt or preempt divinely appointed leadership. We saw bad reason number one, that the divinely appointed leader does something that the rebels think is stupid or culturally unacceptable. Then we looked at bad reason number two, the rebels outnumbered the divinely appointed leader. Those are all bad reasons that people in churches also use. We outnumber you. Bad reason number three, the rebels were older than the divinely appointed leader. That's one that's often used. It's been used here. Bad reason number four, the rebels have been serving the Lord longer than the divinely appointed leader. And then number five, which we see a lot of today, bad reason number five was rebels who have an entitlement mentality or a comparison mentality, claiming that they've had to suffer and be poor while the leader got to live in luxury and wealth. And as you know, that bad reason is very popular today in the tax bill debates going on in Congress. Lots of entitlement mentality and comparison mentality people are screaming and yelling they don't want the new tax bill to give any breaks to the rich. This goes all the way back to the days of Moses, folks. During the presidential campaign, a lot of people were screaming out for Donald Trump to release his tax returns. Of course, all of this is an offshoot of the bad reason number five for rebelling against godly ordained authority. It expressly also violates a New Testament principle set out by the Apostle Paul, and this is new material, by the way, if you want to copy it down, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. It's a very important verse. 
when you start to feel sorry for yourself and compare yourself to somebody else. How come they've got it good and how come I don't have it good? 2 Corinthians 10, 12. Listen to what Paul says. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. It's a very important verse for Christians, especially in the United States, to learn so that we don't start having that entitlement mentality or comparison mentality. Because God for us has given us richly all things to enjoy. The Bible says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We never have to have an entitlement mentality, never. We never have to have a comparison mentality, never. Because the Bible says it's not wise. And the Bible also tells us wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Learning to see things from God's viewpoint rather than temporal viewpoint. When we leave this world, we leave everything behind, everything. It's only what you can send on ahead, so to speak, that will last for eternity. It would transform our minds if we could learn to think that way in every situation. So that instead of thinking, what can I grab now? We think, what can I send on ahead? As we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, as we serve the body of Christ, the church, which is what John was trying to do the day he stepped into heaven. I didn't even know he was coming over here, but he came on Wednesday because we had a Thanksgiving Day service and he wanted to clean this auditorium where you're sitting for the Thanksgiving service. And it was from here that he stepped into heaven. Can you think of anything better than that? Serving Christ in a humble capacity. And as you're serving, he says, you can drop the vacuum cleaner. I want you home. And with joy, stepping into the presence of the living God. I hope you understand, John was my friend. But he hadn't even told me that he was coming to clean. He did it because he was doing it for Jesus, not to get praise and applause. Back to the text. I'm sorry for that. Next, we saw the five bad reasons have logical fallacies because they omit two key premises. Number one, who ordained the levels of multiple levels of authority? And obviously, the answer is God. Number two, who has the ultimate authority placed in the pool of intermediate authorities? And that's the point where the rebels don't like it. They don't like who's been put in a position of authority. We then move from the level of individual rebels to subordinate group rebellion. The first group of secondary leaders that we studied was Korah and his company. They were killed for their rebellion to Moses and Aaron, God's principal intermediate authorities in both the secular realm, that was Moses, and in the religious realm, that was Aaron. A group of rebellious leaders impacted, in that case, an entire nation and the religious structure which was established by God. If we apply that today, that would refer to government and the church. When we did a careful exegesis of that, you recall, we saw that there were two different groups of rebels. There were the religious rebels, that was the 250 Levites that were associated with Korah, and there were the secular political levels, uh, rebels, those who were from the tribe of Reuben. We also saw that they responded differently. The religious rebels attempted to do a religious service in disobedience to what God had assigned. The secular political rebels refused to obey the secular authority appointed by God. In both cases, they received the divine death penalty. The key verse that we looked at was Numbers 16.3, which sets out the methodology and the false premises of the rebels. And that's, by the way, true in most cases of rebellion. They want to give some kind of a rationale, and they almost always do this type of thing. They gathered themselves together. Remember, we're talking groups, not singles, groups. They gathered themselves together, strength in numbers. 
against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, ye take too much upon you. So we saw that they usually start with a false premise. Because Moses, of course, hadn't taken the authority upon himself at all. Neither had Aaron. God had appointed them. Seeing all the congregation are holy. Then they give you a true premise. So they're mixing true things with false things. You will find in every accusation and in every rebellion, there's a mixture of true and false. And they use the true to try to confuse the people who don't think very clearly. All the congregation is holy. That's, of course, a premise that's true, but it's misapplied and mixed with the false premise. Every one of them. Ah, yes, so it's not just us as a group that's holy, but each one of us is individually holy before God. Is this true? This is true. But then they go back to a false premise. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves. There's back to the false premise. Moses and Aaron had not lifted themselves up above the congregation of the Lord. Now, as we began looking at Moses' response, Moses' response gives us 12 principles that the top human leader can use when his authority is challenged. Now, we've only looked at two of those so far. We've looked at the first two and divided them into subcategories. You may not have caught that as we've gone through. I'm trying to make it so that you can put things in organized categories because it makes you think clearly. I always like to do that. <laughs> do organized thinking because that way you come to right conclusions. You avoid false premises. So here's what we looked at so far. Principle number one, always test the false premises and the challenges of the rebels by the word of God. Folks, that's principle number one. The bottom line is the Bible. You know, no matter what they say, no matter what they do, no matter what they argue, no matter how logical it seems, check their premises according to Scripture. Because as soon as you find one false premise, you're going to reach a wrong conclusion. That's the point of false premises, is to get you from point A to point B without going down the path that God said you have to go down to get there. So that was principle number one. Always test false premises and false challenges by rebels according to the word of God. Next, we saw that the accusation of most rebels is based on experience, not faith. They said, look, we're in the desert. Look, there's no uh, milk and honey here. Look, we don't have any water. Uh, you know, it's experience they're arguing, not faith. They had just seen the power of God. Do they not believe that God can give them fresh water if he wants to? They saw ten plagues in Egypt. They came to the edge of the Red Sea, and they saw as Moses lifted his rod over the Red Sea, God parted the waters and they crossed at a place about 100 miles wide. Incredible. Now they're in the desert. Only three days have they forgotten what God is like. People, when you see this kind of ugly rebellion raising its head, Stop and remember. We just heard the choir sing. When upon life's billows you are tempted and tossed, be not discouraged, not all is lost. I'm not quoting it quite right. It says, count your many blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Instead of focusing on all this bad stuff, Focus on the God of the universe who has made all things well. Most accusations of rebels are based on experience, not faith. And that brings us to the New Testament issue of walking by faith instead of walking by sight. They were walking by sight. But you know, in our current culture, it's a very appealing argument to carnal Christians and pagans to walk by experience not to walk by sight. The third principle that we learned was don't let intermediate or subordinate authority give you a fat, proud head or cause you to demand your rights that God has not given you. See, that's how rebels raise other people to follow along with them. They pump you up. They compliment you. They say nice things about you until you're on their side. Moses understood that although he and Aaron were both Levites, God had appointed him the governmental head and established the high priesthood through Aaron. 
Now, those are the first two principles. We saw some subcategories. So I'm giving you subcategories super quick. We next learned how to deal with the three important danger signals of rebellion. Danger signal number one, when you sense rebellion, the first thing you have to do is classification of the group. Is the real source of the group inside or outside the church? I'm making application of the church, dividing up the danger signals. So, classification of the group. Is the real source of the group inside or outside the church? Because as we'll see in a moment, outside sends in infiltrators to be in the church, but the real source is outside. Those outside the church who attack the church are the enemy. They fall into two categories as well. Open attackers, just like in war, armies that are face to face, open attackers, and infiltrators, what we call spies. Danger signal number two is classification of the rebellion. First was classification of the group, second is classification of the rebellion. When you sense rebellion, determine what kind of rebel you're dealing with. And we saw that inside the church, there are two types of rebels. There are the open rebels who willingly come at you face to face to fight. There are the recalcitrant rebels who stubbornly refuse to do what they're told to do. And of course, the church has both types. It will always working in unison to hinder appointed leadership. That's true in every church that has more than two people. Danger signal number three, infiltration by outsiders. So you've got classification of the group, classification of the rebellion, try to determine whether you're inside or outside. And then when you find infiltration by outsider, when dealing with the infiltrators, remember infiltrators also fall into two groups. Number one, those who are like spies from an open enemy. And two, and this is sometimes, well, in many, many churches anyway, is the principal type. Those who used to be part of a church but who left it for carnal reasons and are now seeking to worm their way back into the church. Those three things were subcategory number one. Subcategory number two, next we studied the methodology of the rebels. They always bring false accusations to take the spotlight off themselves. Of course, that's their principal point. But we learned there are six false accusation techniques used by rebels in this text. Number one, word twisting. They talked about, yeah, you promised milk and honey and there's no milk and honey, so they're word twisting. Number two, serious slander of the leader's intent. You took us out here to kill us. Number three, serious uh, false accusations of personal goals and purposes. You've made yourself a prince. Number four, twisting the word of God to mean what it does not say. In our case, what the Bible says for us who are no longer receiving new revelation as was happening in Moses' time. All the people are holy, we know that. Number five, stating what ultimately God would do, but misapplying it. You brought us out here to kill us. Well, you know what? They're going to get killed. But it wasn't Moses who was going to do it, and that wasn't the reason he brought them out there. Although they stated <laughs> what God would ultimately do because of their rebellion. Number six, denying the divine appointment of the leader. In that case, it was Moses. So today, we want to continue with the remaining ten principles in group rebellion. And that uh, are the group rebellion settings. Principle number three, so this is new material. False accusations, you will discover, are always very pious, at least in the context of the church. They're always very pious, very religious sounding, very pompous, and very self-serving, even when a leader has sacrificially served without pay. You know, what comes to mind right now is the national argument that's going on over uh, Judge Roy Moore. I hope you read that uh, article that I stuck in your bulletins today. All this pompous hypocrisy in Congress. The Republican Party would never tolerate such wickedness as this. <laughs> Dr. Don Boyce, who used to be in the Indiana ha uh, State House, House of Representatives, wrote that article, and he did some research and discovered dozens and dozens, not just, you know there are more Republicans who were dirty and filthy and rotten than there were Democrats. And he lists some of them for you. And yet they're claiming that they would never tolerate such a thing, and they couldn't. They want Judge Roy Moore to recuse himself and not to, not to run for that office. Uh, folks, you've got another little thing in there by Bob Jones Sr. in your bulletin today about how all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
And Dr. Bob is writing in that little tiny thing at the end of the second page, I think it is, of your handout today about how all these godly men of the past had all kinds of horrible things said about them. I hope you read that because that brings us right to what's going on here in our text. Now, notice how Moses responded to the blatantly false accusations. There are two parts to this principle. Number one, he exposed their false accusations. And number two, he prayed what theologically is called an imprecatory prayer. Did you know that if you read through the Psalms and you pay any attention to what you're reading, don't just zip through them on your daily reading and say, man, I knocked off another Psalm today. If you read them, you'll find that in some of them, David is cursing his enemies and the enemies of God. He knows he's right and he knows they're lying about him. And so he prays what's called an imprecatory prayer. He prays against them. That's what Moses is doing. Listen to it. Numbers 16, 15. And Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. He exposes the false accusation. I didn't take anything from them, and I haven't hurt any one of them. I have only done them good. I've never done them bad. And number two, he's praying an imprecatory prayer. Respect not thou their offering. When they bring their offering, do something that shows you don't respect it. That's an imprecatory prayer. That brings us to principle number four. God deals first with the subordinate religious rebels. You see, the, the issue of a divine relationship with God is more important to him than the issue of what's going on in society around us. A lot of times we tend to get those things mixed up. And it's easy to do. We should be involved in the politics, political scene because we have that privilege here in America. But God is more important, uh, more, is more concerned about what your heart is like in relation to him than he is on whether or not the wicked are doing wicked things because the wicked do wicked things. So he deals with the religious leaders first, these religious insubordinates. And then he deals with the political ones. <laughs> we want it the other way. Lord, knock off those bad guys in politics, all those rotten guys in Washington and all those washed, rotten guys down in Trenton and, uh, you know, don't worry about the religious stuff because after all, I, maybe I can get my act together between now and then. It's not how God works. God nails the religious insubordinates first. Notice something else. Some of them did have divinely appointed authority, so they felt confident that they could win the challenge hands down. After all, they were Levites. Huh. Now, God, you know, he appointed us. We're Levites. We get to do some of the service of the tabernacle, and, you know, and later it would be the temple, but we get to do some of the service of the tabernacle here, and we're pretty important, and God did choose us to, to do that. So Moses, you're a Levite too. He was descended from the tribe of Levi. Aaron was descended from the tribe of Levi. And so they all wanted an equal share of all the stuff, not just the stuff they'd been given to do. I think they probably thought God would never kill Levites because we're cool. Let's see what God said about that. Let's look at verses 16 and following. Moses said unto Korah, remember he's a Levite, he's got 250 guys with him, be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron tomorrow. See, they weren't, that wasn't the group that was challenging Moses' authority, they're the ones that challenged Aaron's authority. And take every man his censer and put incense in them. So we're gonna do all the procedure, all the mechanics, just right. He didn't say, come in waving hula hoops and throwing incense in the air and hope some of it hits the altar. They're gonna do it exactly the way that Aaron does it. So nobody can say, you made a mistake in the mechanics and that's why this happened. Put your incense in them. Bring ye before the Lord, every man his censer. 250 censers. Thou also, and Aaron, each of you, his censer. So if anything bad happens, Aaron is here with the group. Hey, 
you know, that's a big group, and if something bad happens to the group, I mean, Aaron will get nailed too, right? They took every man his censer, put fire in them, and laid incense therein, and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. So the, set, the scene is set, which brings us to principle five. Listen carefully. Subordinate religious leaders who are in rebellion usually try to instigate and gather the support of the entire congregation before making their move. Now, in this case, it was a stupid thing for them to do because it taught the congregation, at least sort of taught the congregation, a theoretical lesson. Of course, the congregation forgets by the next day. We'll see that in a moment. But so they've, they've got the congregation. It says Korah gathered. He didn't just get the 250. Notice verse 19. It says Korah gathered all the congregation against them, that is against Moses and Aaron, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. We're going to have a church meeting, and we're going to nail Moses and Aaron. It's not just going to be us 250 guys that show up. We're going to show you that everybody doesn't like you. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. That's the Shekinah, the Shekinah. That's the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day. And suddenly God appears in his glory to everybody. Oh, God really was watching, wasn't he? God really was listening to what was going on. It wasn't just that Moses was doing Indian smoke signals back there with a blanket, you know, poof, and there goes one, poof, there goes one. I mean, the glory of the Lord appears as they're all standing there. Folks, that's an awesome sight. That's an awesome sight. John, in the opening verses of the Gospel of John, says that the Shekinah glory belongs to Jesus. He says, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the resident of the Shekinah, the Shekinah. Moses and Aaron and the congregation beheld his glory. Something is about to happen. Whenever the glory of God appears, something is about to happen. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. So that principle number five was trying to gather everybody to get on their side. Number six was Moses and Aaron had something very special. And it relates to a very important doctrine of Scripture. Why did God protect Moses and Aaron? It's on the wall behind me. God's protection of Moses and Aaron relates to the doctrine of separation. If the congregation follows the rebellious leaders, they open themselves to judgment. Moses and Aaron are separated unto God. They are separated unto rebellious leaders. Look at verses 20 and 21. The Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. Now we've got 250 rebels and we've got zillions, several million perhaps, people who have gathered around to watch the show. And God says, you know, separate yourselves because I'm not just going to nail those bad guys. I'm going to nail the entire congregation. I hope you can picture in your mind what's going on here out in the middle of these flat plains in the wilderness and all these people are gathered around and here's the tabernacle at the center and here are Moses and Aaron and 250 rebels who are Levites, who are priests. And they're standing there and God is speaking and I suspect everybody could hear him without amplification. And I suspect they understood every word that God was saying. 
I'm going to nail this whole congregation. If I was out in the congregation, I think I got to go find the restroom somewhere. So I mean, I, get, I had an excuse. I'd get out of there. But notice what takes place next. Number seven. Moses and Aaron are men of God. They walk by faith, not by sight. Number seven, a godly, qualified, appointed, and ordained leader still cares about the congregation. Even when they foolishly follow rebellious subordinate leaders. You know, Jesus said the hireling sees the wolf coming and flees. But he's truly, who is truly a shepherd stays there and fights the wolf. A godly, qualified, appointed, ordained leader still cares about the congregation, even when they very stupidly follow rebellious, subordinate leaders. Look at what Moses and Aaron did in verse 22. Very next verse. They fell upon their faces and said, Oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? Korah was the principal leader. He gathered, you know, 250 other guys who were subordinate leaders just like he was. He'd instigated the rebellion. He got this group that was the power group at the center. And then they had gotten together, you know, all kinds of friends and relatives and all the congregation is gathered around. God is going to tell us where the rebels are. God says, I'll kill them all. But God is giving Moses a test, a test of leadership. You know, you've heard the old saying, the captain goes down with the ship. In other words, the captain, if he cares about his crew, is the last man off the boat because he cares about his sailors. He cares about the cook and he cares about the bus boy. He cares about the cabin boy. He cares about uh, each one of the men in different positions on different parts of the boat. He wants to make sure that those who are under his command are safe before he gets off the boat. It tells you something about leadership when you see that. It tells you something about leadership when you see a man like Moses and another man like Aaron. And they fell upon their faces and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin? And wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And that brings us to principle number eight, which we see very clearly displayed in this text, is that God hears the prayers of a righteous man. That's a New Testament principle, you know. It's over in the book of James. James chapter 5, verse 15, and verse chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you may be healed. Now listen to the last phrase. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Moses was right with God. God has already said about Moses, you know, when prophets, could, I give prophets from generation to generation, I give prophets here and there, but you know, he says, I speak to them with dreams and with visions and in other obscure ways, but with Moses, I speak face to face. As a man speaks with his friend. Moses was a righteous man. Oh, he was a sinner. But he trusted the living God. He understood the character of God. He acted in a way that someone who knows the character of the one whom he's dealing with would act, and it was appropriate, and God answered his prayer. And so we find God spares the congregation based on the prayer of a righteous man. But there was a caveat. The congregation had to obey quickly. They couldn't putter around. God said, okay, I heard your prayer. I'll spare the congregation, but they better move it. They better put it into high gear. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from the, about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Ibiram. And Moses rose up and went out unto Dathan and Ibiram, the elders of Israel following him. 
And he spoke unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing that is theirs, lest you be consumed in their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abiram, on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives, and their sons, and their little children. Now, those are the secular rebels. So we have Moses saying, Everybody get away from three, three different sets of tents. Korah, Dathan, Abiram. Because something's going to happen. And everybody has just seen the Shekinah glory. Everybody has just heard the voice of God. Now Moses says to him, okay guys, you heard it, get out of here. Or you're in serious trouble if you don't. Now, notice something very clearly here. Both the open rebels and the recalcitrant rebels were killed at the same time, but by different methods. We're going to see two methods that God used to kill people here. The religious rebels, those who are the open rebels, are killed one way, those who are recalcitrant rebels get killed another way. But we're going to see an interesting unity in their two de deaths. Both sets of their deaths teach us something about hell. Hell is called the pit. The recalcitrant rebels who refused to obey dropped straight into hell with their families. And remember, your rebellion and stubbornness will affect your family. It won't just affect you, it will affect your family. And secondly, hell is also described as a flaming fire. It's described as a pit. One group's going to drop into a pit. It's also described as flaming fire. The open rebels were burned to death by flames from the Shekinah glory of God. Let me read it to you first. Death by dropping straight into hell. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. So he's countering right now, openly, vocally, the false accusations that have been made against him. He's exposed it. And so he says, Okay, now we're going to have a test. Let's see whether or not you guys are right or whether or not I'm right. Whether or not you are innocent or I am innocent. Verse 29. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. Let's see. They're going to hang around for another two, three years before they die? Maybe some will hang around 25, 34, 60 years before they die. You know right off the bat, if it even extends until tomorrow, God didn't send me. Now, you know you've got to be pretty sure that God sent you before you make a statement like that. Hey, if this doesn't happen immediately, you know God didn't send me. You know, the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 18 gives us the test of a true prophet. It's if, if somebody says unto you, such and such is going to happen and such and such, he says, if it doesn't come to pass, I, the Lord, have not sent him. And in fact, if it doesn't come to pass, you're supposed to take him and stone him to death. That's a rather serious way of dealing with people who claim to have received revelation from God. But he goes on. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited with the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But, and here he's even given the, <laughs> what's going to happen. You know, he talked face to face with the pre-incarnate Christ. He knew what was going to happen. He is absolutely confident that it's going to happen. Let's see the other thing, he says. But if the Lord makes a new thing and the earth opens her mouth and swallows them with all that appertain unto them and they go down quick into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. Now, Moses hadn't been out there digging all night, long, all night long, a great big huge hole in the ground, and then spreading sort of a, a netting over the top or some kind of boards that, you know, his, his subordinates could, when he gave the word, go, and the boards fall, and they all fall down. That didn't happen. This is no accident. This is no coincidence. This is no manipulation that is going on here. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, he's finished speaking, 
that the ground clave with thunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth ah, and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the land that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. And they all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit with the earth and closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them. For they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. Do you think the people got the point? Well, they didn't really. You'll find out later. Observation. God's judgment on the stubborn rebels and their families and the families of the open rebels. See, it hasn't happened yet to Korah himself and to those guys that are with him. But in that first part of the judgment, we find all the secular rebels, and we find all of the other rebels, their families are getting eaten up. The death of those who refused to obey divinely constituted authority in their families was used to terrify the rest of the congregation because these were people just like the congregation. But then there was a special judgment on those who were subordinate religious leaders that was even more terrifying. Verse 35. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Think of standing in front of this curious looking hole and you're there with a bunch of guys looking into the hole. It's on the side of a mountain or something. And suddenly a blowtorch comes out. A humongous blowtorch that fries you all. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eleazar the son of Aaron the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning, and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hallowed. That's interesting. These guys are all burned to a crisp, but the censers where the incense was located. Remember, each one of them carrying a censer, 250 censers made out of brass. And now here are all these burning bodies, probably charred to crisp, but those censers are still there that had the incense in them. And the incense has been burned on the censers. What do you do with the censers? God explains. Take up the censers out of the burning and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they, that is the censers, are hallowed. That brings us to the next principle. Oh my, my time is up. Okay, I'll give you the principle. The principle is that God always intends his judgments. This is true all the time. God always intends his judgments to be used for a warning to future generations. God always intends his judgments to be used as a warning for future generations. I mean, you know, that, that's true of like the flood of Noah. It says so in the New Testament. The flood of Noah is mentioned by Peter as a warning for future generations. But here we find in number 16, God says it specifically also. Verse 38 the censors of these sinners are against their own souls. Let them make those into broad plates for a covering of the altar, for they offered them before the Lord, therefore they are hallowed. And, get this next phrase, they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. Wow. They took those 250 censors, they welded them together, however they did it back in those days, and they made it for a covering of the altar. So that any time somebody was coming to bring something to the tabernacle, they'd get this glint of, you know, light reflecting off this thing. And they'd say, ooh, what's that? Ooh, that's, that's the brazen censers that are welded together. Do you remember when? Oh, yeah. You've got to be careful that you don't do what God tells you not to do. You're in serious trouble. God intended it to be used that way. His signs of judgment. He gives a visible representation to remember for the people what happened. Did you know God has done that for this generation from the flood of Noah? It's called the fossil record. Millions of dead things buried by water all over the earth. God has left himself a witness of judgment.
These are to be a memorial unto the children of Israel. He's told them he's going to do it for covering play of the altar because they're going to be a memorial that no stranger who is not of the seed of Aaron come near to offer incense before the Lord that he be not as Korah and as his company as the Lord said to him by the hand of Moses. Well, we have to stop there. It's a serious warning that we're dealing with a holy God. A holy God who has ordered the way that we live, has ordered what we are to do in our worship of him. And there is much strange fire being offered in so-called churches today that is not of God. It's of the world, the flesh, and even, in some cases, of the devil. When we come into his holy presence, we do come with thanksgiving. But we come with awe that the God of the universe is the one whom we are worshiping, and we must do as he has commanded. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you, Father, that you, the living God of heaven, have given us illustrations of your great love. Certainly the cross is the greatest of these, so we cannot complain. Father, you've also given us clear pictures of your judgment. We see it here as we consider the rebellion of Israel ten times against you. They weren't, as Moses himself said, they weren't rebelling against Moses and Aaron. They were rebelling against you because you are the one who set it up the way that it was. Father, we pray that you'll keep us from rebellion. Help us to remember that you are a long-suffering God. Yes, as in the days of Noah. Which, as Peter says, the world that then was, was overflowed with water. And you've left us a record of that. Because there is yet coming a judgment. A judgment of fire upon the earth. And it's designed to warn those who are lost so that they might trust the only Redeemer, the Ark of Salvation, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you will take your word as it has gone forth this day, that it will not return to you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.